calling because this man is an idol worshiper, really, in the Ur of Chaldeans, and beginning his journey of faith. But God called him out of that. And he says, you're going to go to your country, your kindred, and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I'll make you a great nation. And he gives him this promise, and Abraham was 70 years old when he received this promise. And he goes on and on, keeping on talking about what God's going to do in his life. And then the Bible says, in verse 7, then the Canaanites were in the land. Uh, the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring, I'll give this land. So he built an altar there. Lord, who had appeared to him. I remember the first time that I built an altar to the Lord in my life. You know, we have physical altars in the church, and that's one thing, but I'm talking about building a life altar to the Lord. Abraham receives this amazing promise, even though he's undeserving of it. The sovereignty and the providence of God has hit him, and he steps up to it, and he builds an altar to the Lord. And then he goes on in verse 8. He moved on to the hill country east of Bethel. And he pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and he called upon the name of the Lord. Yet again, in the very next verse, another altar. Another time of worship. And he goes down into Egypt because of a famine. He comes back in verse 13, 1 through 4 comes up from Egypt, then Lot went with him, and he was very rich in livestock, and he journeyed from the Nagab as far as Bethel to the place where the tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai, to the place where he had built the altar. There he is going down to Egypt and coming back to the place of the altar. Later on, in the same chapter, verses 14 through 18, the Lord said to Abram after Lot had separated from him, Lift up your eyes and look at the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land that you see I'll give you to make your offspring there forever. And I'll make your offspring as the dust of the earth so that no one can count the dust of the earth. Your offspring can be counted. Arise and go forth through the length and breadth of the land that I will give to you. So Abram moved his tent and came and settled by the oaks of Mamre, which is by Hebron. And there he built an altar to the Lord. God calls this man and he builds an altar to the Lord. He travels on to the promise that God had for him. He builds an altar to the Lord. He travels a little further. He builds an altar to the Lord. He goes down to Egypt. He comes back to the altar of the Lord. God separates him and Lot and reestablishes his covenant. And he builds an altar to the Lord. But perhaps maybe the most difficult altar experience that he had is found in Genesis chapter 22. If you'd open your Bibles there with me. difficult altar. After these things, verse 1, God tested Abraham and he said to him, Abram, and he said, here am I. He said, take your son. says, take your son, your only son, whom you love, go to the land of Moriah and offer them here as a burnt offering on the altar on the mountain, which I shall tell you. I have one child, one natural child. I couldn't imagine getting that word from the Lord. Could you? Especially after the man had gone through so much. But once again, God's calling him back to the altar. And he crawls up there. He's taller than me. <laughs> he rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac, and he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place that God had told him. And on the third day, he saw the place from afar. 
And Abraham said to his men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and come to you again. And he took the wood of the burnt offering and he laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took his hand to the fire and the knife and they went both of them together. And Isaac said to his father Abraham, My father. And he said, Here am I, my son. He said, I see the fire and the wood. But what gives? <laughs> Where's the lamb? And he said, God will provide himself a lamb. And they went down together and they came to the place that God had told them. And Abraham built an altar. And he laid the wood in order. And he bound Isaac, his son, and he laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And there he took his hand and he took his knife to slaughter his son. Don't worry. <laughs> but the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here am I. He said, don't lay your hand on that boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God and you would not have withheld your son, your only son, from me. And he lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. Now, let me walk through this for a minute. On the beginning of this word... Abraham did not question God. And I want to suggest to you it's because he knew the value of an altar. God was calling him to go, to rise up, to go on the mountain and to go to the altar. And he set off for his son. And the Bible says he rose early in the next morning. And he did it. He rose early in the morning. I don't know about you. I think I probably would have tried to sleep late that day and postpone it as long as I possibly could. But he rose early. And he took him up there to obey God and to release to God what was that one thing that was the most valuable thing on the earth. For so long he had desired this one thing. I mean over and over over and over again. 26 years this man waited for this boy. 26 years he waited for the fulfillment of the promise of Isaac. And when he comes, God says, take him up, go to the altar. Abraham sets his alarm clock early and he does not snooze. He gets up and he goes to the altar of the Lord. And he lays Isaac on it on top of the wood. Goodness, I don't know how he could do it without tears streaming down his face. And he lifted up his knife. That was not an act. He lifted up his knife, the Bible says, to slaughter his son. So let me tell you now, this is such a odd thing from the Lord to ask. But then if you look at it from another angle, it's really not that odd at all. I have learned in my life the value of an altar. And there's times I've gone there intentionally. There's times I've been dragged there because life has beat me up. But let me tell you something about those things that you cherish. It might be a person. It might be a child. It might be a career. It might be your calling. It might be a spouse. But anything that you choose to put above Jesus in your life, I have experienced in my life, I will lose that. Jesus will be first and preeminent in our lives or he won't be the Lord of our life. Well, God, you'll understand this one thing. You know, I mean, this is going to sound silly to you, but these are some of my altar moments. I remember as a young man, I wanted a wife. The Bible says he who finds a wife finds a good thing. And I thought, I took the Lord at his word. So I was looking, man, I was looking hard. I mean.
mean everywhere. <laughs> I remember at this pizza restaurant I worked at in Murray, Pauly, I thought I was the best pizza maker in West Kentucky, and do still carry that skill set into my present situation. And I was like every day looking, could she be the one? Is this one the one? Trying to work up the courage to ask the next one out, you know, because I wanted a wife. And I remember one day when my bubble got deflated. This girl comes up to me and she says, do you know why none of us will date you? I'm like, oh, this ought to be interesting. Is it my big nose? Is it my... Uh, I don't know what that is. You told me. Uh, she said, you're too good. She said, we like the bad boy. That's stupid. Okay, uh, this has nothing to do with the sermon. This is a free lesson to you young ladies out there. Men that are bad, before you marry them, you're not going to change them. Hey, man, maybe I need to change my sermon. <laughs> Pursue a man that is chasing God as fast as he can. And if he's not chasing God more than he's chasing you, then you don't need that man in your life. If that man's not chasing God more than he's chasing you, you don't need him. That's free advice for all you single folks out there. And I just took that and I'm like, okay, well, I don't plan on changing, so okay. And then I went to Christ for the Nations. Some people jokingly call it Brides for the Nations. Because this is where I'm going to find a godly spouse. And I majored in the Ring by Spring plan. And I thought, you find me a godly woman here. And I found them, and they all put me in the friend zone. You know what the friend zone is? No dating. You're stuck being the friend. You can't ever get past that. I'm like, look, and I'm like, God, I just want to get married. I'm so alone. All my friends are married. God, what's the deal? I remember one day when the Lord brought me to the altar. And I offered up Isaac, which to me was being married. <coughs> Lord, man, at that age, that's all that was important to me, getting married. And I crawled up on the altar, and I had to pray a prayer. God knows when you mean prayers. You can't fake him out. I got to the place where I genuinely crawled up on the altar and I said, God, I choose you. If I never get married, Lord, send me to the uttermost parts of the world. I choose you. You're all that matters to me, Lord. I can't care less, Lord. I just want to be in the center of your will, Lord. I lay it on the altar. Lord, take it, Lord. And you know what? He did. And I got to the place I could care less. Let me tell you something. Crawling to the altar, like that's not easy. That is not easy at all. Let me tell you what happened. Two weeks after I prayed that prayer and meant it, I prayed it three weeks before that, but I didn't mean it. I meant it that time. I came back to a mission conference here at Christian Fellowship Church. And there was this pretty little girl <coughs> representing a college ministry in Murray. Now, I'd said my prayer to God. And she had made a vow to God, God, I'm not dating anyone. I, I'm just going to devote myself to you. And I saw this girl, and I went home to Dallas, and I looked at my roommate, and I said, well, I didn't think I was getting married, but I met my wife this weekend. And he said, you did. I said, I sure did. <coughs> and I knew it was a God thing. It, when God's in it, it, it's easy. So I came back after school, after Thanksgiving, and I looked this young lady up, 
we kind of became, quote, friends. Started dating on Christmas night, and I proposed one week later. <laughs> one week dating. After years and years and years of striving to make my way happen, you lay it on the altar and you crawl on the altar and say, God, this is yours. And honestly, if he would have never answered, man, I would have missed out on a wonderful lot. But I would have been content to be in the center of his will. That place can only happen at the altar. Now, I'm not talking about the physical altar. I'm talking about the altar. Now, by the way, we did not have a long engagement. After I asked her to marry me, I left the next morning to go to a church planning thing in Romania, and I thought I was living there six months. Ended up being there two months, and I came back, and a wedding is planned to a rank stranger. <coughs> Pretty much. <laughs> we dated one week, came back, and a wedding's planned. I don't recommend doing it that way, by the way. But it was beautiful. It was God. And it happened at the altar. Second thing happened at an altar. And this one was hard. Very hard. I remember my dad telling me when I was a young man, Richard, you're going to be a pastor. And I said, no, no I'm not. And he said, yes, yes, you are. And I said, Dad, you're barking up the wrong tree. Ministry is the furthest thing from my mind. I don't want to do that at all. And he said, well, God told me to start saving my sermons for you, which I've still never seen one of them. I'm like, okay, God, whatever. Lived my life, lived in the world, came back here to Christian Fellowship, went on a mission trip. Janice was on that mission trip, and God rocked my world. I'm telling you, if you've never been on a short-term mission trip, you need to go at some time in your life. If not for any other reason than to make you more thankful for what we have here in this country. I'm taking my son next month, at the end of next month, on his first mission trip to South Africa. And I am so excited. Last week after chapel, uh, he went to the altar, and the Lord spoke to him, Dad, I'm supposed to preach my first sermon on this mission trip. <laughs> Let me tell you, you want to see some eyes water up, that'll do it right there in the heart of a dad. Like, yes, all right, I can't wait. It's going to be good. And God, I went on this mission trip. It was in uh, the border of Mexico. And something unique happened in me because I was not a crier before. This was the moment that defined my emotions for the rest of my life. I was not, my dad was the crier, and I used to kind of think he was a sissy for crying as much as he did. My dad could be a man, good grief. <laughs> it's just the truth. I went on that trip, and I remember we went to this little place, and these kids, by the way, there's this one girl that she just got in my heart. She was the cutest kid on the face of the planet. And she's in a picture in my office, and uh, I just picked her up. And you were supposed to give them two pieces of candy. Everybody had to say the same amount. And I just kept stuffing the candy in this girl's pockets. I mean, they were just bulging out. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to be the most favorite person of this kid right here. And she kept saying something in Spanish over and over and over. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, honey, that's right. You know, I understood zero Spanish. You know, you're just like, yeah, that's, yeah, girl, yeah. Or you do, like, if you don't understand, you speak really loud English because that helps them understand better. <laughs> kept doing that, you know, and then really slow in loud English. Yes! Yeah, I'm like, that's going to help. And then finally, I'm like, she keeps saying the same phrase over and over and over and over. And I went and got the translator. I'm like, what is this girl saying? I've been patting on her. I've been giving her candy. And the translator said, She's saying, put me down. <laughs> I thought I was the greatest missionary on the planet. But, but it was on that trip that God birthed in me a heart for the nations. And it was unmistakable. Came back, went to the school of ministry that Brother Parrish had started, moved to Africa in 1999. And it just becomes solidified in me. This
this is going to be the rest of my life. I love it. I love it. I love the world. Man, God still has a special place in my heart for Africa. I met Jenny. She had a heart for the world. And our plans were, we're going to get married. We're going to spend the rest of our life living and dying for Jesus in some third world village. That's what we wanted to do. Until one month after we got married. God called us back to the altar. And a man gave me a prophecy that I'll never forget. Many of you remember an Indian man, DGS Denakri. Some of you have prophecies by him. He said, brother, I don't know you. I don't know your story, but I have a word for you. Okay? He said, God took you to Kenya. And while you were in Kenya, he did this in you. I'm like, whoa. This is interesting. He said, then you went to Romania, and while you were there, the poverty of the people broke your heart. That had been my last two years. He said, but what I'm going to tell you next is going to shock you. He said, God is asking you, if he gives you a church in the United States to pastor, will you accept it? Because your main ministry will be in the U.S. And all of a sudden, you would think, hallelujah, a word from the Lord, yay! I was angry. One, because my dad was right when I was a middle school kid. <laughs> but the second thing was, God was calling me back to an altar of something that I loved and wanted and was good for. And it's not even a bad thing. It's a good thing, God. And I wrestled, and the whole time the Lord is bringing me back to this altar place. Until finally I crawled back up on it again. And I said, Lord, I just want to be in your Lord, you can have it. You can have it, Lord. You can have it. And the rest is, you know. <laughs> Perhaps one of the biggest altar moments in my wife and I's lives is with the battle for children. <laughs> that was a tough one. That was very, very difficult. When we got married, now don't judge me for this, I did not want kids. Mostly because I was selfish, but and I wanted all of my wife's attention. Still a power struggle in our house between me and Trey for who Jenny's going to focus on. I joke. She got pregnant. Now, Men, I gave a free word of advice to the girls. I'm going to give you a free word of advice. My wife got pregnant in 2003, and she told me, and my first word was, oh, no. <laughs> Never do that. Life is a gift from the Lord. A big one. <laughs> the greatest gift from the Lord. Obviously, it didn't take me long to fall in love. With the child, we bought everything imaginable in green and yellow because those are the neutral colors, you know. And we lost that child. And that was the hardest thing that we've ever bought. It was very difficult. If you walk through that, I want you to know I understand. And it hurts. And there's a hole in your heart that will always be in your heart. The Lord heals, but it's there. And then we prayed, and I, at this point, wanted a bunch of kids, you know. And uh, we prayed, and God blessed us supernaturally through the birth of our son. And we knew that we weren't finished yet. So, uh, we spent the decade of our 30s trying to have children, but nothing happened. <coughs> nothing. nothing. Procedure after procedure. We spent thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars trying to make it happen in our own flesh. We prayed. We got mad at God for about a year. It was difficult. This altar was a little bit harder for me to crawl up on. Because as a husband, 
seeing my wife just be decimated every month was a, a rejection, was a failure. Because we weren't conceiving. And I dreaded it. I'd hold her while she cried herself to sleep. All along wondering, God, why? Why, why, why won't you answer this prayer? Life is a gift. And the Lord asked me to crawl up on the altar. And I said, I can't, Lord. No, this, this is you, Lord. This is, this is from you. He said, crawl up on the altar, would you? It's back to the altar. See, I don't know if your life mirrors mine or not. But it seems like my life in Christ is constantly going back to the place where it all started at the altar and releasing to Him good things and bad things and letting His will be done. See, the altar is a place of crushing. It's a place of trust. Man, it is hard to release something that you want so bad and trust God that He knows what He's doing. It's a place of death to yourself and flesh. See, Abraham knew the value of that. And finally, after years, because my flesh really wanted this one, I crawled up on the altar and I said, God, here I am once again. Lord, if it never happens, I choose you. Because you're all that matters, Lord. I want to be in the center of your will. And you know what? Now at age 40, none of your business. <laughs> I'm so thankful for this plan. Let me tell you something, church. The altar is the place that God is calling us to in this church getting back to that place of releasing. See, I think for far too long, the Lord has had us on these journeys and we really try to press something ourselves. We try to make it happen. We strive. We claim, Lord, we pray. We steer the ship as far as we can and nothing seems to happen. Let me let you off the hook. It's not up to you to make it happen. It's up to you to live a life of surrender at the altar. Of getting to that place where God, this is hard. I don't want to give this up. But it's yours, Lord. Here I am again at the altar and I release it to you. See, I think oftentimes we look at the altar as a one-time experience. You know, Lord, I gave my life to you. I haven't changed my mind. I'll let you know if I do. No, it's not like that. An altar is not a one-time visit. It's a lifestyle of releasing and emptying yourself and just getting to the place where the Lord is calling you to be in His will and relinquish control. See, I took you through Abraham. I don't know Abraham's desires. See, that's something that's never logged in the Bible. We don't know if Abraham wanted to leave Haran. We don't know if Abraham wanted to leave his family and his friends that he grew up with. I mean, God gave him this word, and he responds to it. But the Bible doesn't indicate what Abraham felt. I guarantee you there was some sort of turmoil with his flesh. Because there always is. There always is. It's this battle of who's going to be in control of our lives. But immediately, he goes. He travels. He goes. And when God even took him to the most difficult altar of his life, he rises early in the morning and packs his son. He makes his son carry everything. I kind of do that too. And they get to the altar. God, this ain't easy. But I surrendered my life to you a long time ago. This is what you said. Oh, wait, wait! So 
I'll give you two choices. One, live the life surrendered at the altar. Two, on the other hand, try to keep something from God. And look how far that gets you. There's not one thing that Jesus will take second place to. story. Some people really want a spouse. You better stay on the altar. If that becomes an idol in your life, it's a dangerous place for that to be. Stay on the altar. Release it to the Lord. Some people in here, you're ready for that, for that child that I was talking about. You better stay on that altar. If that becomes a desire greater than him, I'm telling you, it will lead to destruction and hurt in your life. It'll hurt you. It will destroy you. Some people, you feel the calling of God to something, but you don't want to lay down what it takes to get there. I understand. But you're not going to be happy until you do. You're going to be miserable. Keep steering that ship. See how good you do with it. You can't get his calling away. Last I checked, the Bible says that the callings of God are irrevocable. They're without repentance. In other words, he's not going to change his mind. It's what he's called you to do. You better just crawl up on the altar and say, Lord, okay. I don't really want to do this, but okay. So we don't have the power to do that in our flesh. But the crucified life on the altar does. It does. Abraham lived there with every moment. Back to the altar. Back to the altar. It's been a picture of my life, too. Lord, I've spoken of what you've laid on my heart today, and I know it's not a normal sermon. I've spoken on what you've laid on my heart. I've been as obedient as I know how to be. But right now, Jesus, if we pause for a moment. And I pray that you begin to deal with our hearts. You've already been stirring in hearts by your Holy Spirit. And I ask you right now, Lord, to give us the boldness to not live a lie with us in the driver's seat. I just want to give a simple altar call. If there's something that you know you need to lay on the altar, maybe you've done it a thousand times, but you're still struggling with it. Or maybe it's the first time God's showing you, I want this. Once you get out of your seat, I want you to come down to this altar. I want you to just give it to the Lord. Maybe it's a desire. I don't care what it is. But I know there's people all in here that there's something that you need to lay down and crawl upon this altar and let the Lord deal with your heart. Who's going to be first to make it easy for the next person to get up and obey the Lord?